Okay, so before we get started with uh, Jamie's um, portion, I thought we would all start kind of with the baseline of um, what we're talking about. So I'm guessing we're all librarians, we've all heard of the craft test. And I personally um, did not like the idea of the craft test, but I did love the word crap. Um, I love to joke about poop in all of my classes. And so I did use it at times um, just because I like saying crap 48 times in my class session. Um, but I did always kind of tweak it to things that I thought were a little bit more pertinent to the students. Um, so, you know, uh, we've had people talking about this apparently going back to I did not realize um, about 2016 or so. But these are some other things that people have done um, over the years. So there's the five W's. People took uh, crap and turned it into carp. Uh, we had the rad cap. And then more recently, we have ACT UP, which also takes into um, account things like privilege, as well as um, other things that are more related to um, critical race theories and things like that. And people are writing articles because they're noticing that there are problems with fake news, for example. And so uh, for those of you with emotional intelligence, um, I haven't checked to see if this was a good article or not, but according to them, people with uh, greater emotional intelligence are better at spotting misinformation. But um, whether that's a reliable source or not, people are writing about it and they're thinking about it. And that's part of why we wanted to bring this all to you. Um, newspaper reporters have been trying for quite a while. And so the uh, lady on the right, um, this game Factitious, she created it in 2016 because she was noticing as an LA Times reporter, um, there's just a lot of problems out there. And then in uh, 2012, uh, we have the gentleman over on the left, um, he created the News Literacy Project. And I didn't realize this was a thing, but there's a National News Literacy Week that he puts out there and they've both got quizzes and different things that they can use to um, try and teach people how to pick out, you know, the fake news and that sort of thing. Um, they've both started out working with K through 12 students and then somehow American University got involved. And the lady on the right started working with them and started hearing from the students, oh, my uncle needs this so badly. Or, you know, my mom could use this really, really badly. Um, and so that's when they started opening up more to the world. And so these are tools that we can use um, with our students now. And so what started this discussion were these two particular articles. Um, one is an op-ed from the LA Times. And I have a copy of that. If people can't get to it, it is behind a paywall. So if you're not a subscriber to the LA Times, you may not be able to get to it. But if you need it, I can definitely get it to you. Um, the article on the uh, left, sorry, um, lateral reading is one that is available. It's open access. It's um, available to everybody. So we have a link to it off of our LibGuide um, if anybody wants to read it if you haven't yet. And I highly recommend reading both of them. The one on the right is more of kind of like a summary of what's on the uh, left. So it's a uh, far more quicker read um, and kind of gets to the heart of the matter of what is in the peer-reviewed article, which is a much, much longer um, article, but both are really, really good. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, as I am, um, please do read both of them. But just to kind of get the gist of what both articles are talking about, um, you know, they start off with this problem, like the 2020 election, once again, demonstrated how easy it is to spread misinformation online, right? Uh, we've got, you know, people from Russia, we've got, you know, who knows where, um, we've got bots, we've got AI, we've got all of these different problems. And these uh, folks from uh, Stanford decided to try to figure out what was going on. And so they went to a state university and um, conducted a study. And so what they discovered, though, is that a lot of us are using advice from a report from 1998, uh, back before there was social media, back before there were a lot of the things that are causing the misinformation, making it so easy to spread. Um, and so what they did was they surveyed 263 college sophomores, juniors, and seniors at a large state university on the East Coast. And let's just say when they first started, they really did poorly. Um, only three out of 87 students engaged in something called lateral reading. 
and only two students correctly questioned the site's credibility. They had two sites that they were um, taking a look at, and they had um, very, very few students be able to tell the difference between what was satire and what was real. And so um, what the students are being taught is things like crap. Thank you. Uh, that was what they discovered as part of the problem. The way we're teaching these students to fact check is not a good way of doing it. What fact checkers do instead is they don't just read vertically, they have a bunch of tabs open and they're comparing and contrasting. As they're going back and forth between these different tabs, they're looking to see what people are saying. Um, are they agreeing across the board or is this one article that they're reading that they're thinking about citing? Are they just way off? Um, and so with that, I turn it over to Jamie. Hi, everyone. I'll go ahead and, and share my screen. OK. Just get everything adjusted. All right. Um, so today, we're here to, to just to share my experience teaching lateral reading. Um, <clears throat> to give you a little context, university, this is for a university, um, a freshman seminar course uh, called University 100. Um, not all incoming freshmen are required to take this class, but about one third of, of incoming freshmen end up taking this class. Um, each U100 uh, schedules two library sessions. And um, the first is reviewing library services and resources, as well as an evaluating sources activity. The second session is much more of a traditional library lecture based on their information competency project, which consists of an annotated bibliography and group presentation. Um, the previous SLOs were um, to identify key characteristics of a credible source and to critically examine sources to determine accuracy, credibility, and, um, and or bias. Um, the old exercise I used to use was based on the crap test model, and it was really vertical reading. Um, staying within the site, students were placed into groups and evaluated two websites, comparing and contrasting dates, their sources, bias, purpose and tone, author's credibility, etc. cetera. Um, for the most part, they stayed on the website and evaluated based on what, what they read within the article. Um, I even created a fact-checking news guide, and there's a link to that in this presentation. And then COVID hit <laughs> and pandemic teaching um, was a thing. I transitioned to teaching over Zoom March of last year, like many of you, and it was very difficult and overwhelming. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of you who can relate, but teaching to 25 students who do not engage with their cameras on or are shy to speak up left me like I was teaching into the void, <laughs> right? Do I have students? Are they paying attention? Are they listening? No one knows. Um, fun story, two weeks ago, I had one student, the only student with their camera on, and I'm pretty sure they went through the drive through for his lunch. Um, to his credit though, he, he was only one of the handful that were participating with the reactions and likes and comments. So I just hope he wasn't the one driving. <laughs> um, but this left me to think of how to reimagine the library sessions and to work with engaging the students um, actively, but with low stakes, meaning no group work. Um, students, I know I get anxiety when I get into breakout rooms. So I wanted to, I wanted to provide students to do independent work um, and fill out Google forms so I can um, collect their answers and read them um, instead of relying on voluntary participation. Um, my colleague, who is the previous U100 coordinator and whom I often collaborate with um, these activities for freshman students, shout out to Susanna Ingsisten. Um, uh, she was actually one who found the activity and we've developed new SLOs based on lateral reading techniques. So the new SLO for the class was after the session, students should be able to recognize uh, reliable and uh, unreliable sources of information by reading laterally instead of vertically. 
uh, in order to understand who is behind the information being shared. Uh, this activity has been adapted from uh, an activity from Civic Online Reading Project. And there are additional teaching and supporting materials for this activity available. Um, and it's, there's a link for it in this presentation. Uh, okay. So this is the lesson from Civic Online Reasoning. Uh, this lesson introduces students to lateral reading, a strategy for investigating who's behind unfamiliar online source by leaving the web page and opening a new browser tab to see what, what trusted websites say about an unknown source. Students watch the teacher model, uh, model lateral reading and then have a chance to practice this strategy to, de to determine who is behind the website and ultimately if it's trustworthy. Um, what I like to do is to um, I show both these videos, which are from uh, CORE. Um, and the emphasis is that you need to look outside the source to determine the website or organization's credibility. And it's much easier to verify if there's a bias prior to digging in to what the article is about. So there's these two videos that we watch in class. Okay. Um, what this activity does and is uh, it has students to look at two websites about minimum wage. Uh, to, be to be clear, both are not credible. Uh, the first one is from an organization, um, the Employment Policies Institute run by Berman and Company, which is a fiscally conservative nonprofit American think tank and conducts research that publics um, unemployment issues, particular particularly aimed towards uh, reducing minimum wage. And its parent company is a lobby group for restaurants, uh, hotels, alcoholic and tobacco industries. The second article is a crowd uh, crowd sourcing platform and the authors are typically students um, and none of, the are, none of the articles are fact checked or have any journalistic standards. So my experience, students experience. Uh, I haven't done a formal assessment, but um, you know, my this is my experience from reading their responses in their Google Forms and teaching over Zoom. Um, first of all, students are hesitant and lack the confidence and skills to identify key areas of a website. Um, even looking for an About Us page uh, was challenging, and this was somewhat shocking to me. Uh, I thought freshman students who have been digitally native most of their lives would be able to do this naturally. However, using different terminology in the core activity, one of the questions asks, um, what is the sponsoring organization of a website confused many students. And as a librarian, I have to remind myself that digging into credibility has been, become second nature to me and students are not as invested in this detective work all the time. Uh, this is probably more of a self-reflection on myself and then I need to do a better job preparing students on the different terminology um, and information literacy lingo that has become second nature to me, but it's not as well known for students. Um, the activity also has them looking at Wikipedia. So students are skeptical about using Wikipedia because they've been told all the, you know, not to trust it. Um, and they, uh, they're delighted to hear that it has some purpose. Um, I actually love to show students uh, on the flip side, I love to show students half note, which um, uh, anyone doesn't know about. It actually translates recent Wikipedia X, um, uh, edits into a visual display of sounds. Um, and it, it creates a real-time graphic so you can see how quickly information is changing on Wikipedia. Um, it's a really great, uh, it's a really great source to show students to understand the complexity, complexity and dichotomy of using Wikipedia as a source. Um, next is the hands-on time. Um, students actually liked having class time to individually evaluate the sources and then come back to review the answers together. Um, having this time on Zoom to just independently work and coming back has worked out well for the students.
and then my experience, um, use existing resources. So um, CORE is a, has tons of uh, activities about lateral reading. I encourage everyone to take a look at it. Um, developing the new exercises takes a lot of time. So using existing activities in Merlot or Project Cora or Core, um, I know everyone here probably has some suggestions. Um, I also think looking outside the library fi library field is also helpful. Um, we actually we heard about uh, Core through um, first year experience conference and not through a library um, conference. So looking outside the field also is helpful. Um, some student com comments. Students question the concept of professional fact checkers. Um, they don't think it's a real thing. So I have to, you know, and, and I'm not sure if that's because of the current political climate, but I have to explain what that is. And, um, you know, they are also more inclined to think that information is correct if it aligns with their point of view. So when looking at the two websites, um, they, you know, the, the second website, which was the crowdsourcing one, they were more inclined to think that that was correct and that they would use it. Um, and I'm not sure if that's because they agreed with it. <laughs> slow readers, freshman students are slow readers. Um, and my previous exercises that I used to um, uh, have with students, I would actually have them read two articles and it just took so much time. But this first step of lateral reading is looking outside the source. So they don't even have to really read the article yet, right? It's just verifying that the, um, that the organization is credible first, and then you can go into um, the other issues. So. I think this really sets them up to, to find if the, in the, the organization is credible, um, then you can go into um, other models of verifying if the information is, um, is, is worthy of using. Okay. Share. And yeah, that's been my experience so far. Thanks, Jamie. That's all. Thank you so much for sharing your presentation. Um, there were a few questions, and I think some of them were answered in the chat. Um, I think this is time for Q and A. Is that correct? Okay. Um, I did notice. So, I, at first, I wanted to say, like, let's all just give a round of applause to, to Jamie for her presentation and for being here today. Um, I did notice that there is one hand um, up, so I just wanted to just. Just double check if that um, if you have a question because this will be the time to ask it. So um, I think your name is Jim Salisbury. Um, I do see that you have a question. If folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat as well. So Jim, just to double check, um, you were the first person to have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Okay, so it looks like there that was probably a mistake. So I'm gonna move yeah. on to the next person. No, my, my question has been answered. Then. <laughs> So I'm all set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Brenda, right. I see your hand is up as well. Did you have a question? Um, I, I love the SLO. I thought it was very um, forward thinking and useful, but I'm, I don't know how you would assess it. So I was wondering about that. Thank you. That's a really great question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the assessment aspect of it. Um, and I would really have to consult with um, probably one of my colleagues who is an assessment librarian to see how you would do that. Um, because I find that students are, are, are still even getting, uh, even after demonstrating the activity, they still are getting it wrong. So it, I think it's also about consistency and training students to think differently, right? That's really helpful because with our SLOs, we're not allowed to have them unless we can also say what the assessment is. Mm. So it's been difficult for us to be too um, innovative <laughs> with our SLOs, even as, especially with standalone sessions, because finding some way to assess and track it is, is a nightmare. So thank you. 
Yeah, I would really have to work within, I think, the program of University 100 to, um, to assess that concept and work with the program to, to also have, train faculty to also teach this way as well. Thanks for that question. Let's see. Um, there's some comments happening in the chat. A lot of great comments are happening. <laughs> Let's see. Um, some folks are saying, I wonder if I could build in the failure that comes with practice into the SLOs, the feedback loop. Um, let's see. A lot of, about assessment can take place by pretest and post -test. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I, I didn't catch any other ones in the thread, so I might have missed that. Um, Sarah's asking if someone can please post the SLO again. Um, I can share my presentation and, and um, you can you, the, the SLO will be there. We'll get that to you shortly, Sarah. Um, we have another question from Luva. Um, are you using this lateral reading to assess websites only, or are you utilizing this with databases? Um, right now, it's just for websites. Um, and yes, we plan to um, share the, the PowerPoint presentation, Rebecca. That was another question. So we'll coordinate that with Jamie. Here's one um, question. Are you using this lateral reading to assess websites only, or are you use, utilizing this with databases? I, I haven't thought about using it for databases. That's a, um, I, right now, it's just been used for websites. And it looks like Michael has his hand up. Just wanted to comment quickly that um, I have been using these sorts of methods for um, for databases as well for uh, scholarly articles, um, because frequently um, I find that using Google or using Wikipedia, uh, you know, as a, as a source for lateral reading with um, with these sorts of with even scholarly articles, you can still find out quite a bit about you know. Um, the uh, the credibility or you know or particularly controversies that are going on around uh, a, a given source. I actually you know was using um, one of those today. Uh, so that's uh, just it, it, it can be easily adapted. Thank you for that comment. Um, I also think that would be a useful tool for upper division students as well to teach them you know to learn you know understand what scholarly articles are and what um, distinguishing um, journals and, and uh, doing lateral reading in that technique for upper division students, I think would be helpful. See, we have a comment by, from Tracy. See, um, I've had them Google the researchers of peer reviewed articles to find out information about them, find out if there are controversies surrounding them, et cetera. And then Mary just echoes great point. Um, we also have a question from Jennifer asking, does anyone teach um, citation mining anymore or use citation indexes like SCSI? Or Amanda says, I do, Jennifer. Amanda, would you like to share more about your experience? Sure, um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, great. Um, I have my students uh, look and see, you know, what citations they'll search. Google Scholar is one option uh, because that'll get you some things, including book chapters. Sometimes we'll use Scopus and that gives them a chance to find information. Sometimes that doesn't reveal problems. I was working one disgraced researcher, Eric Pullman, who um, was fined for uh, 
misuse of data when getting um, federal grants. Some of his articles are still out there and they are not tagged as being uh, retracted or anything like that, even though his data was wrong. So um, it requires a little bit more depth and even just outright Googling will finally find information about his misdeeds and his jail time. I had a real quick question. Tracy, you mentioned that you have them uh, Google the researchers of the peer reviewed articles. Do you go out and look for articles that have controversial researchers? or authors? So um, the way that I've used it was with a specific assignment where students were evaluating a particular news article about um, claims that there was a lot of voter fraud. And there was a particular um, scholarly article that was posted um, and, and circulating to support this idea that there was a lot of voter fraud um, in not the most recent election, but the previous one. And it was the only article that people were citing. And so I had my students go out and research all of the claims in the newspaper article, including a link to um, this one scholarly article. So they had to go out and determine what did other people say about the scholarly article. And they found out that there was a lot of criticism of the math involved in it and so forth. So it was part of a, a much more complex and larger assignment that they were working on. Thank you. And Jeremy, it looks like you have a hand up. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed this. I, I, uh, I love the, the, what, what you said about students having, you know, some hesitation to believe sources that didn't confirm their beliefs or whatever. I mean, that are the example with the think tank that, you know, was arguing for a lower minimum wage was a good one because some of the organizations that create misinformation have really, um, branded themselves, you know, with all these um, ways of, of uh, trying to appear legitimate and scholarly. And uh, so I, I wonder how, how far sometimes you might have to ask students to go to uh, question the, you know, the purpose or the um, legitimacy of an organization that is presenting, you know, pseudoscientific information or something like that. But I'm glad you just mentioned that that students have a hard time sort of understanding the idea of objective um, truth or objective uh, research. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, um, students I find are really skeptical, um, but also they're skeptical of information, but at the same time, if it confirms what they believe, they want to believe it. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of that dichotomy of having, um, be, have being objective to, uh, to be able to evaluate something. So I really like the aspect of lateral reading because you're not reading the article first, right? You're looking outside to confirm um, the, the organization's credibility. So you don't get bogged down to wanting to believe it or wanting to use it because it confirms your beliefs. Um, so that's one reason why I really like lateral reading. Yeah, we have another question about lateral reading as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Bill is asking: um, Is anyone using lateral reading techniques as the research for writing projects, where the balanced judgment is the conclusion? For example, it's a question for librarians who are writing. Uh, writing yeah, can you articles? can you expound on that a little bit more for us? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Uh... So if you're doing a, an annotated bibliography or something, if that's an assignment for your students, or if the students are doing a project where they're they're comparing sources uh, because they think one of them either is reliable or or it's not reliable, and they want to explore that, I was just curious if anybody is going approaching it at that level using uh, lateral reading, not so much as um, and I just heard what Jamie said about comparing um, the or looking at the credentials of the of the publisher before you look at the uh, the content of the item. But my question was more thinking along the lines of looking at the content of the item uh, and then really questioning it and looking at uh, uh, looking laterally for other things that that either comment on that source 
uh, and give reasons for disagreeing or agreeing and so forth. I don't know if yeah. that Yeah, um, I, I, I want to also just say, I, I still believe in elements of the crap test, right? I just think that the lateral reading should be the first step. And then once you, and then afterwards, we also go into um, looking at the evidence that they use in the, um, in the article itself and whether or not, um, especially for the second source, um, maybe, you know, some of the, it, just like we look at Wikipedia and we sometimes can use um, their references <laughs> instead of using Wikipedia, Maybe if we really like that article, we can fact check what was in there to see if any of that would be helpful. Thanks. And then I just wanna also say, I put in the link for the exercise from uh, Project Core that I've been using, um, as well as um, the website for Core. Um, and in that lesson is the links to the, um, the articles that were used, and the, the complete lesson plan. Um, I'm, I'm not taking credit, it's not mine. <laughs> I just wanna make sure that, you know, it's from, or from CORE. Is there anything that you think that we should start um, looking at first when we're engaging in some of this content or considering it? Um, first, I would, I would probably watch the two videos that they produced. I think they're really, they're, they're two to three minute videos. Um, they really set clear guidelines and show, um, I think they're just really helpful and useful for students so they can they can see what the activity is. So I would definitely take a look at those two um, videos and I will um, link them in the chat right now. Thanks, Jamie, that's awesome. I think everybody's really excited to take a look at that if they haven't. Um, I see a lot of people commenting on that they're really engaged and wanting to move forward with that. I know I have a lot of um, catching up to do on some of the things you shared, so that's great. Um, and I, I, I wanted to know, just um, just kind of thinking about this work, uh, are people coming from, what types of libraries are people coming from maybe? Um, for instance, um, I know Jamie, you're from the Oviatt Library at CSUN, uh, but are other folks coming from different libraries and maybe you have any um, tips for, for folks in different types of, of library settings or um, other types of settings as well? Um, right now, I think it's difficult engaging students over Zoom, <laughs> This, um, which is why uh, I've, I've been having difficulty having conversations on Zoom, right? Um, so I really liked the idea of creating Google Forms to ask these questions and give them time to answer them in case they don't want to engage that day or are too shy to, to speak up. Um, I at least have their answers somewhere. So um, I just used um, the, the exercise and the questions they, they asked, I put them into a Google form. Um, and uh, that way I'm not left just talking to myself. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, I think it's really important to think about different ways to engage folks, especially in pandemic brain. <laughs> Um, and all the different, and I see a lot of people are coming from community college. So we know in the community colleges, especially I can say that um, students are really struggling with like housing insecurity, um, homeless, houselessness, low wealth, um, responsibilities. And so I think, I think it's great that you're thinking of ways to support learners through all of the, these struggles that we're first facing, including, you know, racism and, and so forth. So I think, um, it's really appreciated. Um, there, I did see that some folks are coming from um, from high school libraries as well. Um, and I also see that some folks are talking about Jamboard. So um, I'm not too sure if you've also used that as well, because um, I know there's a Google product. <laughs> I have it, I have to look into it. Oh, I see a question about, on their phones, they're, they're zooming on their phones and how to engage them that, that way. Um, that's, that is really difficult, right? Because I, you know, like I had mentioned in the presentation, um, 
you know, the student, I know he was on his phone and I know he went through the drive through but then he was also participating. So I think students are really flexible. Um, and and I, I, I've actually, I don't do a traditional library lecture anymore um, over Zoom for that reason, because um, I, if they're gonna be in a database, I'm not sure that they're gonna see the complexities of what I'm doing and how I'm narrowing a search and how, um, you know, using the limiters. So um, I have them do uh, Canvas modules ahead of time where I explain all of those, everything I would go through in a traditional lecture, they go through um, in a self-paced module, the way we use our class time for activities like, like I'm, um, I presented on. I see folks talking about other tools that they use as well. Um, and you use Canvas at, at um, CSUN? Yes, we have Canvas. Um, folks are just saying that they really enjoy your flipped classroom approach. And the other people are saying that they do badges as well. Mm -hmm. And I think you do badges as well at CSUN. Yep, thanks to Ding. <laughs> Um, I think we're all kind of just thinking of, you know, what else we want to talk about. Um, is there anything else you think you'd want to share about today's um, topic that we should know about? Um, if you're, if you're just interested in the, um, the activity, I would just, I would look at the activity first before diving into, um, the civic online reasoning um, website, because it's very there's so much information in there. I would first look at the um, at the actual uh, the the videos and then the um, activity that they came up with um, because I think it's really straightforward and, and easy to to follow. Um, and there's just so much information in core that uh, I, it gets me overwhelmed looking at all their activities that they have. So um, I would first uh, just look at that. Thanks, Jamie. I think that's a really good tip. Uh, let's see. I do see we have a question from Andrea. Um, they're asking, what's in your Google Forms um, that you use for your class? Um, so in the activity, there is um, there's questions, guiding questions that uh, that you that that are asked of the students to um, to engage with lateral reading and to um, uh, evaluate that website. So I just turned those questions into a Google form. Okay, great. And I think you're going to be sharing some examples with us. You said you mentioned. Uh, oh yeah, it's it. All the links are in the presentation, and um, I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, my Google slides again in the chat. All right, thank you so much, Jamie. I think we're kind of getting towards the end of our presentation, so um, if there aren't any other questions, I think we. I just if we could just give a um, a round of applause for Jamie and her time, and also thank the web committee for all of the ongoing wonderful show and tells that they've made possible um, during pandemic. <laughs> I just think like this has been a really great way to engage and um, you know, it has been rough. So uh, it's really great to like be in community with other folks and see what, what you're doing at your campus. So thank you, Jamie, so much for your time. Um, I see a lot of people just giving you um, props and thank yous <laughs> and we look forward to looking at your your um, content. Uh, before you leave, uh, don't leave yet because I just want to uh, share a couple of, of things that um, you may want to know about. Uh, let me just get my presentation screen going here. So um, guess what? If you didn't know, but you probably do because you're here <laughs> and, you're, and you get emails from Lily, uh, we actually have a, a yearly conference that takes place usually in the summer. We currently have um, a call for proposals and we'd love for anybody that's interested in this year's um, conference topic um, to put up in a proposal or if even if you're unable to put in a proposal, we always encourage folks to come to our conferences. They're all free. Um, this year's theme is um, what you don't know and are afraid to ask, teaching ourselves and others. Uh, we'll have different ways for folks to share presentations, including um, 10 minute lightning rounds, uh, poster, a virtual poster session and virtual roundtable discussions. 
So please consider um, submitting a um, proposal. And we just wanna just thank you so much for being here today. Um, I know I learned a lot and I hope you're leaving today with something um, or you know, uh, something to look forward to. So thank you so much and have a beautiful day. And um, I hope to see you at our conference.